I'm Leslie Cornwell, Certified Nurse Midwife with Empowering Midwifery Education. I have Catherine Berry here with me. I loved hearing her story. We started about five minutes into it and the internet was so awful a few weeks ago. So she's got better internet because her story is too, too important to tell and hear clearly. So Catherine, thank you for rescheduling with me. Indeed. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, so uh, what I usually have people start out with is their midwifery journey, who they are, their background, and then we can just go from there. Okay, um, well, I live in Northern California. My name is Catherine Barry, and I'm a licensed midwife. I've been licensed since 2014. Before that, I was a direct entry midwife for most of my career. And I've been doing um, home births in uh, Northern California for about 25 years. I was trained as a community health care provider. And um, to us, that was from birth to death, really, and everything in between. So um, I love the birth work, but I love the work with families. And um, in my community, we were, we had wildfires that kind of shook everything up in 2017. And at that point, a lot of people left. And a lot of people dug in deeper, and I feel like that was an opportunity to dig in deeper and really show up as midwives and healthcare providers to see what else can we do. Right. Um, I, I was trained um, through apprenticeship, and mm -hmm. I got my license by doing the challenge exam. In California, we need to have a license through the medical board. So mm -hmm. I challenged that um, with my uh, midwifery experience. And a license because it was necessary. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's amazing. I mean, especially I would love to expand on the conversation community health care provider because before medicine and before we got the stigma of midwife with women, we actually were the doctor. We were the community health care provider. Like I would I know there's a lot of midwives out there trying to get more and more of a push of public health care provider than so I would uh than what we are currently affiliated with. Um so I would love for you to expand on that a bit more. Well, I had the um, fortune of being trained by Constance Miles, who was my preceptor, and she was, uh, she came from the farm training in Tennessee, um, and like a lot of the women in that generation, she also got a nursing degree eventually to have more access and um, be able to provide care in that model back in the 70s when things were really different. So I was trained by her. And it was the ability to show up on that spiritual realm and support and the with women and with families and also possess every skill that you would need in any circumstance and have it all in your hands and your heart and your brain um, and the equipment in your truck to yeah. provide that. Yeah, well, it's been exciting doing these interviews the last month because it's been a lot of midwives that are older and years of experience, and a lot of them were trained on the farm. Like it was just organically happened that way. But you could hear a very clear delineation of the ladies that were extenders of the farm. They would go to these little pockets all over the U.S. and they would do paramedic. They would do all these other services. Out, it was the community aspect. There was a very clear theme for the midwife extenders out of the farm. So how do we revive that again? Like I just I feel like we get so pigeonholed when we're like you either pick a midwife or a doctor versus let's just step back a little bit you are a community health care provider that serves all aspects of the family needs in that community we're the glue that keeps the family units together how do we shift like a stigma and a culture that's went this direction back that way it's interesting um i always go back to collaboration Mm -hmm. We have to get out of that us and them narrative, which is so antiquated at that yes. at this point with the amount of information we have of how to be better communicators, I think. Mm -hmm. So the more we collaborate as new midwives coming up in the community, I always encourage newer midwives, let your face be seen by providers when it's not uh, an emergency. Go, if you're getting concurrent care, go with your client to an appointment and introduce yourself because you're just there to learn more and connect. Right. Um, and every opportunity you have in the community, make those connections so that they can communicate with us and have curiosity. Um, and what I learned to do was let me get training everywhere. 
Let me get EMT training. Let me get um, dispatcher training. Let me get training in how to do trauma recovery work. So always going within the community to get um, exposure mm -hmm. and more skills beyond, because yeah. we all come out with the same basic midwifery skills and basic, um, I think, herbal knowledge, things like that. But what do we expand upon with that? Um, I personally um, love doing births. I attend deaths. Um, if it's a child who I attended their birth, I'm probably going to be at their death. Yeah. And I love that people think in terms of I'm now going through this huge initiation in life. So I'm going to go back to the person who was with one of the biggest initiations, which was my midwife, and trust her to hold those pieces with me. Um, I also am learning to be more of an educator. So I've had the opportunity to teach at Heart and Hands with Elizabeth Davis for the past seven years. Um, I raise and train service dogs, which gives me opportunity to do crisis call-outs in the community, in the high schools, um, when we have traumas and deaths. Uh, I trained as an EMT. I am a law enforcement chaplain. Um, if the police or coroner show up at your house because your loved one has died in the community while they take care of their job, uh, we volunteer and come in and take care of the family during that crisis for the first couple of hours. Um, mm -hmm. And you and haven't all even tapped places. on the research you've been doing with placentas and fires. Like that was so fascinating to me last time. Like, how do you, it's I mean, these are immense ta talents and skills you have. The average midwife is probably blown away right now. It's very impressive. Oh, I appreciate that. Well, as I said, we have been plagued by fires. It was a good five-year period where our community was living in smoke. So the World Health Organization and their Wombs and Wildfires Project um, specifically were studying Sonoma County as an opportunity to see how did that affect placentas? How did that affect birth outcomes? How did that affect the formation of cords and amniotic um, sacs? And it was really fascinating because it, it does have an effect. Oh, the respiratory, um, and, I can't even imagine just being the, the air, oxygen deprivation in a chronic low-lying stable. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's been really, um, it's changed a little bit how, um, we think about placentas in a way because we've seen such an effect on the placenta being yeah. in a long term because it will be months at a time that we're in wildfire smoke. Yeah. It yeah. Be, it's the extreme of secondhand smoke and it's the natural version it versus the partner. And yeah, the, the placenta is supposed to be the filter and protect the baby, but there's only so much it can filter. And yeah, it's only so much. So just encouraging um, students to also look at the placentas and record everything you see, even if you don't have the language for it, yeah. um, because there might be a story, there might be something to trace there and be available. Um, the Wombs and Wildfire Project was so happy to get in touch with home birth midwives because it was a different point of view. They, of course, have easy access to hospitals and OBGYNs, but we wanted to give them that point of view also. Yeah, well, and the true community aspect, I mean, there's a lot of things that you see and you get a deeper relationship being in their home and the family units that the data in a typical hospital system only gets the more objective medical approach, you get much more of the quality and the socio um, perspective that the average healthcare provider can't see and document. Yeah. So I, I'm just, I'm blown away by your skills and talents. And so I'm afraid to ask you what you do for fun, because it sounds like just being a continuous learner and expanding, you're kind of like me. It's like, my fun is just learning new things. <laughs> I do love learning new things. Um, I love painting. I'm kind of obsessed with painting landscapes right now. Um, okay. I live on a farm and I would say I'm farm adjacent. So I get okay. the benefits and beauty of farming without having to do the hard work. Um, I live all I around kayaking. the for that exact same reason. I see them yeah. out working so hard. And I said, I'll come to your produce stand. <laughs> yes. Um, and I love kayaking. I love hiking. Uh, nature. I spend probably more time outside than I do inside. Um, and I have a great community of friends and chosen family that... Okay. Um, they're just fun people. We love to laugh. And I'd say the other part is the midwives I get to work with, I love being in the room with and they bring fun to my life. 
have you always been in the same part of California or have you like moved in different parts? So that has a huge aspect when you want to truly be Mm -hmm. the community based midwife. They've known you for a very, very long time. They know you're not going anywhere. I think that's sometimes hard when there's different levels of midwifery and you found the ultimate one of not just the continuity of care to take care of her for five, 10 years while you're working there in the area, you know, these ladies, I, I, I get the closest I get to that for traditional midwifery is like the Amish and Mennonite community because they're having 10, mm. 12, 14 babies. You have a relationship for 20, 25 years with them versus just two, three babies. And so you're taking it to that next level and how could we get trainings or how can we get other midwives to have this paradigm shift that we are community-based care providers. Community-based care. You know, it's interesting. Lately, I'm having more interviews where folks are looking to me as a spiritual advisor or okay. what ritual do I bring to their birth? And I pull it back and I say, I'm a community health care provider. So let me get you in touch with everything you need to set up your life to raise this child and all the resources you need. And I think it's part of the basic education and helping midwives know and helping the other community providers know um, what you can do within the community and how you want to show up. And the licensure is great in that it gives us access to families for the care of midwifery, but we also can provide well women care. We can also provide lactation support. And within those years that we're doing that, what else do women need? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of trauma support we need, especially in my community. Um, And so the more studies that we do beyond just the spiritual part of midwifery to learn that skill. And sometimes it's just people calling on the phone and describing a scenario. And my answer is that's when we go to the ER and hearing the midwife be able to say, hey, you know, thank you for calling me first. And it's a good time to bring your kid to the ER and I'll meet you there. But that helps. Um, You know, recently we um, helped a family that was having a really bad fentanyl problem in the home and we had to get a baby out. Number one, let's get a baby out of there because that's a recipe for death. Um, Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, hooking up the addict with um, the resources to get help and getting the other parent in a safe place with that baby. So um, making sure that you know your resources, you work with your community, you um, learn more on that aspect because we meet people at such a vulnerable time and we have to be gentle with their souls and not expose their vulnerability for our Instagram or influencer and because we want to use those vulnerabilities to build real connection and allow them to grow beyond just the midwife because I am not their container for life, but I am present for their care for life. Um, There's this amazing quote from Paolo Colo and it's uh, the world has changed by your example, not your opinion. And I I think that's really important for midwives to remember because I'm full of opinions, but really my job is to ask open-ended data gathering questions so I can provide care and figure out what care they really need um, and do it by example. Yeah. And, show yeah. them- and that's kind of that action speaks louder than words. Like we can talk, 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 but I, I see the great things you're creating. You see the barriers you're filling, you're filling in the glue in the broken units versus you're just telling them, oh, you should do this, this, and this. You're like, I see we're missing this in the community. I'm either going to create it or I'm going to make something like ticking. And honestly, few midwives, it, I think they feel <clears throat> so um, vulnerable. Like I can just barely survive, let alone thrive. Mm. And so how, like, I, I, we've coined a midwife hierarchy of needs with our consulting work all the time, because I want you to get to your highest power passion Zen. But if we have so many midwives and families across the country that are in that rat wheel, that how do we just get them to pause a little bit to challenge a little bit themselves, professionally leadership so that maybe they're not ready for this level, but you and I can slowly inspire them. Cause I think a lot of times they see you and I, and they're like, Oh, those are those outlier unicorns. And I was like, no, you and I are pretty average ladies. Like, but it's also, I think 
and I don't know your background, but mine, it was kind of how can we get people where crisis isn't what gets you out of comfortability and gets you to grow to your potential? Like that's what's fascinated me with psychology is how can we get enough people that they thrive for greatness, but it's not human nature is like comfort, comfort. Oh crap. I, this is too uncomfortable. Now I'm going to grow to my potential. How can we skip that? That's the million dollar question to me. I've always been challenging. <laughs> Well, you started with the word pause. And I think the pause is the brilliance. Mm -hmm. Because if you can take that pause in every moment, we learn how to respond instead of react. Mm -hmm. So we save a lot of time there. And then keeping ourselves in the equation, especially as midwives and healthcare providers, we are taught to take ourselves out of the equation. Yeah. You know, sleep when you die and live on caffeine. That's how I was trained. I was like, this isn't sustainable. I love Mm -hmm. snacks and I love my bed. So um, I made it, the number one priority was where I was in the equation so I could show up for others. And Mm -hmm. I raised children. I've been a parent since I was 21. And I learned very early, if mom's not happy, nobody's happy. But it applies to the bigger picture. If I am nurturing and taking care of this community of people, yeah. Um, my health is number one and my example is number one. So yeah. I can't ask you to get mental health support if I, I'm not doing that for myself. I can't ask you to exercise and change your diet if I'm unwilling to do that for myself. Um, so I think training midwives to, it's a fine line because we also have where midwives are being trained. I am so sorry, honey. Okay. Um, uh, to like I've heard, I don't do early labor is a new training that is coming into the vernacular. And I'm like, well, I understand that because if you're not taking great care of yourself, early labor can really zap you. Um, But that's not the solution to not show up for they're trying to hover to the symptoms versus getting to the root cause of the issue they're they're trying to assemblize the little bit of survival tasks they can handle anymore but they're not actually realizing yeah i think a big part of it is that mantra of self-care is self-aware it's not being selfish and i think as moms and midwives and our stigma you, you got to keep your house tidy and everything everything you feel guilt like it took me forever to sit in a bathtub and not feel guilty oh there's the pile of dishes oh there's this oh there's that like once you get into the habit and you see the ripple effect of investing in yourself, it, it goes tenfold the other direction. But until people take that leap of faith and people say, I take vacation, but then they're like watching the charts and never separating and still not take stopping care. I'm like, that's not vacation. <laughs> not vacation. Well, I learned from Mary Jackson uh, years ago, who does the pre and perinatal psychology training. And she was telling a story, but the essence of the story was um, the midwife's lack of self-care manifested in more complications with her clients. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, I believe you know, that. it wasn't direct. And it just, she, that was the one factor that she could find in the client complications was, I'm not my optimal. Oh. And I really took it to heart. And um, so uh, I also, I want to give my uh, clients support, not shame around it right? Mm-hmm. And finding those places of what is self-care for you, whatever it is. And then I also the example, they know, like, I'll be honest, I'm canceling two days because I had a birth. And that's what I do to take care of myself. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I also take care of my clients in that way. I'm like, I could, if I push through and show up exhausted, that's not fair to you. That's no. not really your pre It's all how you approach things. I think too many people say, well, she only hired me. My vision of what midwifery is, is to be available 24 seven for her. I said, that's not realistic of a human being, but somehow we went down. I think a lot of the midwives, there's huge debates on it. I'm not saying one's right or wrong, but also are we in a sprint or a marathon midwifery? You can rush, rush, <clears throat> rush, and you crash and burn, which is a high percentage of the burnout rate. Then the community has no one. If you push for one lady, you right. push for this you are now here for three, four years versus 30, 40 years. Like we have to, we have to, whatever the women have to do, I think because of COVID, especially I saw a massive uptick of retirement and exhaustion because the guilt of every woman deserves this time of birth. But I'm like, you're one person, take more students and have good boundaries. So that ripple effect versus you just take one more because nine months later you kick yourself and it's too late. Like it's not the 
the birth's going to be five minutes after she leaves the consult. We we get so emotional not thinking about what's coming the next six to nine months because of that commitment. And I think that's where the ego in the room gets in the way because the ego doesn't have great discernment. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of that in the influencer um, narrative is um, I was taught to leave my, my stuff in a box at the doorway. Yeah. And I come in and I'm just there to provide that safe container for the birth to unfold. Um, but if my ego is involved in what I think in my narrative, my discernment's out the window. Mm -hmm. um, and then how do I take good care of me and how do I take great care of my clients? Um, and it's a fine balance every day, right? It's always a balance of um, having a life and getting to be a midwife. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I can see the coolest seminar you could do being a wife or having a life and being a midwife, like 101, because I think too many people know it, but when it comes to it, they're in autopilot. Like you said, pausing the power of pausing when you start the consult, like, okay, I just ran 20 times, but I'm going to pause 30 seconds, take some slow, deep breaths before I go in this room. Cause I don't want the energy of the past part of the day to come, whether it's the ego or the energy of whatever you're prior doing, this is their experience. This is why I want what's best for them. So the power of pausing people just go on autopilot too many times. So right. mm -hmm. we do, which I think is, you know, connected to exhaustion and mm -hmm. um, overwhelm, which is easy to get to in yeah. this career. Um, another part I think is very important is the community of midwives. For mm -hmm. me, I know <clears throat> if, you know, every interview says what happens if you're at a birth and mm -hmm. um and so i know i have six midwives i can call who are going to yeah. come in so i can split my team and bring in two more if it really looks like that and having that peace of mind and trusting in the community and that takes a lot of effort too because wow midwives in a room together that can be a lot um mm -hmm. and keeping those relationships but that's important to look at. If you're a midwife who's isolating yourself from your midwifery community, do yeah. you have two, three, four or five people who will back you up? Because mm -hmm. that gives you a sense of, I can let this down. I don't yeah. have to hold everything. I can get sick. I can drop the ball. There's people there. Um, so I think that's a really important part for a tight yeah. midwifery Well, and community. I would assume from day one, you didn't have that. You were part of the creating that community, creating the students, creating the community of those midwives. Because the average midwife across the U.S., especially central um, and like the rural communities, they would dream of having what you had. And I said, you have to create it. Like anytime you create a business or a community, I get <clears> you're <throat> doing a three-hour radius, but I don't want you doing a three-hour radius forever. I can't instantly give you six backup midwives but we can make a strategic plan if you know that yes you're on this rat wheel and you're feeling frustrated and can't have a vacation and have boundaries but we're working on stepping stones of how to find you a good student that's not just to teach but is also going to join your community and mission interviewing differently your students from the beginning has a ripple effect of what you are going to have in three to five years so sometimes people feel so disempowered like you're talking it'd be great to have backup yeah let me know Leslie I can't get that I said but you may have to create it I'm not saying it's tomorrow but in three months year <laughs> year and a half let's talk about what you would like to see and let's start planning that. Cause that's the essence of getting you through these like survival. I consider survival is you don't have a clue and you're continuing this and this is not going to change anytime soon versus, mm -hmm. you know, this kind of sucks right now, but I've got a plan for it. I've got options. I, I know in nine months it'll be better because I cut my volume down. I found some different revenue or I got a student that's graduating. Like that has a very different light at the end of the tunnel than just exactly. I'm trapped and I don't know what to do about it. And it's kind of how we get through a birth too. You're like, right. okay, let's make a plan for two hours and then we'll reassess in two hours. And as long as I know I have a plan yeah. when I'm really managing something, I can do this. But if I have no plan, I'm just like, oh, where is this going? Mm -hmm. um, and to build community, um, there's a doula in our community who was a doula for, she retired after 35 years. And mm -hmm. I think about her going into the hospital decades ago and being like, I'm the doula and I'm going to do this. Um, and then being like, what? But either way, she used to go recruiting. So she would go to gatherings of doulas or midwifery information things and find other doulas to work with her and mm -hmm. train them and make a community. 
And I learned that of where are other people who are interested in what I'm doing gathering and showing up there, you know, and often there's snacks, which is great. Food and yeah, um, women and food and chocolate. We don't argue about those. Um, So that was part of building community is just really going to, and if you're a midwife, I'm like, why would I go to that dual meeting? The connections, you have to always be making the connections um, to build that. And I was, at the time, I was the only apprentice in my community. There wasn't people apprenticing at the time. I didn't have other students. So I would travel uh, down to San Francisco so I could meet with other students and study. Um, But um, I didn't have a community of uh, students around me. So when I'm very uh, proactive when new students come into the community, I'm just getting people together for tea or a walk. Like so that. other midwives, if you're in a community or you know there's a mid- another midwife, just ask her to meet up. And I ask, I've done it for decades. doesn't mean that there's any even obligation, but meet each other and see yeah. who knows who and make the efforts. Yeah. Um, and that's how we build that. Yeah. Well, and a lot with my business consulting, you just talking about like relationships, there's four value currencies that we think of time and money if you're conditioned more the corporate world. But as midwives, I always stress like relationships and knowledge is so much more valuable, particularly relationships. It's it's unlimited. You yeah. never know what what door, what opportunity, what connection will bring you in your future. Um, we need more right. midwives feeling comfortable networking and open houses and going to other, creating yes. a neutral space where maybe you wouldn't normally meet with the lactation or doulas or EMTs, but just creating a neutral space for you guys to have calm conversations. Because I think too many times, a lot of our stress and anxiety is we don't know that person. We don't understand their role. They don't understand our role. We don't have a neutral space because the few times we interact is not the appropriate time to be having those conversations. (laughs) So we also, we put together a, um, a CEU class for EMTs and paramedics um, so they could come and learn what to do and what it looks like at a home birth transport. I've called an ambulance six times in 25 years, but those six times, those folks are terrified and they don't want anything to do with a compromised baby. Um, and we're working on getting that program into our local junior college. Yeah. So everyone has to take it when they're going through. But even putting yourself out there like that, I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm putting myself out there to bring in paramedics who they could tear me apart. I don't know what it's going to look like, Um, but taking that leap of trying to find a way to bridge those gaps. Yeah. Um, And the folks who came to the classes were great and they were so happy to talk about their birth traumas as EMTs, but also walked out feeling more confident in having yeah. them and just simple things even if someone doesn't decide to do a CEU just say hey can I come speak to the EMS class can I come speak to the medical students can I come <laughs> speak because you want to be branded as the community expert so when they are older and they they're in those systems you have a ripple effect of allies that you don't even realize it's not just about how can we help each other now like that may be the OB in the future you collaborate with he may be the mm-hmm. hospital medical director and now they're talking about expanding a midwife program because I think when we show people normal and opportunities of cross learning that midwives otherwise sometimes rumors and then these other things spread because they just don't know so they're going to figure out on their own <laughs> whether it's right I or know not. yeah you know we have um we have a unique community in that a lot of our uh care providers doctors OBs midwives first responders have home births so transport to the hospital and she's like oh hi my former client who I caught your baby two years ago taking care of us so that's you know we're a little more advanced in that way and we have a lot of easy collaboration in that way Mm -hmm. Um, but it wasn't that way 25 years ago they weren't taking that risk in hiring a midwife to have their home birth it just was too edgy Um, so it took a while but if any community can get there by doing the legwork and I am just so always grateful for the women who did the work before me because really I get to ride on their coattails I get to walk into the hospital and they're like hey Catherine glad you're here what do you need sometimes what size gloves do you wear um but I was you know really um my hand was held 
in my career to get there. Yeah. Really well, and that. I know California, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, they have it a little more progressive than the rest of the U.S. because I know there's Southern mm-hmm. midwives. Like I just did a consult with a midwife in Louisiana as a new graduate and like the level of hostility and the level of like, okay, they're grateful for the eight midwives in the entire state that are fighting the fight, but how to do it strategically and build that momentum in a positive way because there has been the other history there. They're on a coattail of a negative trajectory and how to pivot it and change things in some of these states like Mississippi, Georgia, um, and Alabama in particular, they're they're having a whole new level of challenges, but you got to start somewhere. I mean, just positive, warm, reinforcing. So just teaching baby steps that um, cultures can always be changed. It's the personal interaction that you leave that person with. And we've had them where they walk away like, now I have to really think differently because mm-hmm. you guys are intelligent and you did all the right things and my narrative is wrong. And mm-hmm. they're almost bummed out in a way like, oh, I think no, I because wrong. it questions their ego and like how many <laughs> other biases and how many other things have I thought over the years? It yes. makes people a little anxious of like, is my identity really in question? Like those subconscious. <laughs> it's, but. it's yeah. But, um, and I really believe it's just making those connections. I I always laugh that I have the benefit of having a shaved head, so it's hard to forget the shaved head that wife, where they're like, yeah. you know, the one with the shaved head, whether they're yeah, you stand out, yeah, you stand out, but... I stand out, um, but it's beyond that too, and um, and it's paving the way for every other midwife. So any midwife who comes in and interacts, they have a good taste in their mouth of what a midwife could be. Yeah, providing opportunity, whatever they do with that opportunity in their interaction is. Um, their choice, but providing opportunity for the next midwife to uh, maybe have more, more curiosity. Um, well, and I think that hits providers. home to the the phrase you were saying about um, the world's changed by examples, not your opinion, because you don't come in telling you, you should think this way, you should act this way. You're thinking of the greater community of midwiferies, and you're not representing just yourself and the client in front of you. You're thinking in the bigger, like, I'm representing midwifery for my community, and I'm going to give up, uphold high. Like, you have a different approach than the average midwife does. Was it something you've always had, or do you feel like it comes back to that training you got when you were um, first getting started? truthfully I think it comes from my youth and following the grateful dead around the country and I just learned community and we take care of each other um and the folks I went to college with we became family uh 35 years later we're still as tight as we were um when someone is sick or dying we are all together so I think to me community just made sense and when I found it I in all the communities I operate in, what can I do more? How can I have more interaction? Because I mean, we're humans. Why are we here? We're here for these intimate interactions okay. is really what we're looking for as humans. So um, I I think it was just my coming up okay. and where I was raised. Um, and I was raised in the tri-state area in New York City and New Jersey. Mm-hmm. And it was just such a... Um, there was a variety of humans there yeah. and it was also so this bigger concept this bigger yeah. concept of what what humans look like what their What's demographics possible, are yeah. what they do there was you know um so i appreciate that part of new york city bringing that to me because you saw everything if you were going to the museum you saw every walk of life in getting there um and it made an impression on me i think Yeah. And that's part of my worries with this next generation, just in general of human beings with the AI and the the social interactions. And just like, I I was like, how do we get back to the basics of knowing each other and just as a whole, not just in midwifery, but how do we get back to knowing what relationships can be and what is community? It's not having your Facebook friends. It's not having this virtual Mm -hmm. world you live in. Like, how do we get people when they're so young and they haven't really been exposed to that other place. Like I love, um, there's a few ladies do a lot of the traveling, like the more you can expose your yourself and your kids to other things versus just the same routine, the same habits. It ingrains people that new is scary because I've never been exposed to it my entire life. Yes. <laughs> and the only way we can create new brain pathways is actually by getting new impressions. You have to see and experience new things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and those then those neuropathways are really turned on. 
Um, so, and for me also, as I said, I've been a parent since I was 21. So I got to learn as a young single mom, how to make community and how to really connect. Mm -hmm. And my kids were my biggest teachers because oh. you get to dive right in or, or it can be a burden. And I just, mm -hmm. I love being a parent and I dove right in and, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And just learning how to be a community member with these yeah. little people in tow. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you scream the abundance mindset. I think that's a big part of it too, oh, that I you. see in the um, midwifery world is there's a lot of scarcity, a lot of fear and a lot of anxieties. And you can have a glass half full and a glass half empty. And I think too many of our colleagues, it's always the negative. There's too many barriers. It's too tough. I don't want a student mm -hmm. because in all competition and like, how do we I mean, I get to the blessing of connecting and pulling to those few and then trying to get them to teach. But how do we if people aren't willing to even just acknowledge a lot of their problems and habits are their mindset? I think that's the hardest thing I have with consulting work mm -hmm. is I can teach that business plans. I can teach knowledge all day long. But until you are ready to recognize some of these challenges and issues are you and how you think it's been very difficult. So if you have suggestions on that, I am all ears because I try to do the gentle inspiration without scaring and insulting people. Like there's that too harsh of direct accountability feeling that people get and then they just cower more. <laughs> well, what I was taught was <clears throat> in the abundance model, the more midwives, the more options, mm -hmm. the bigger the conversation is. Yeah. The yeah. more people are going to have home births yeah. and the more opportunity for me to work with exactly who I want to because mm -hmm. I'm not carrying the space for every single person who needs a midwife because there's plenty of people are not a great match. Yeah. So that's what I was taught. The more, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it's kind of a farming concept. The more you pick, the more you get. Yep. Um, cause I came to California to be a farmer. That's what I did oh. for 10 years before midwifery. But, um, so more brings more is yeah. what I was taught. And I try to live that. And I have seen that we have an abundance of midwives in my area and it has raised the home birth rate in our area over the long term. I mean, I've been watching this yeah. for decades, mm -hmm. but I'd say we're a little bit higher than the rest of the country in terms yeah. of our yeah, the compounding effect, the trajectory that sometimes it feels so small, like, oh, we took it from one to two percent. But I'm like, it's not linear. Like you'll have a ripple because every student got the mindset of how important it was to have a student. So now they all have students like we don't see the trajectory. Things go like this. It's I don't know any graphs that go like this yeah. or like this. It's either down real fast or um. so, yeah, I think just, just so being bad. able to have your energy of like it's truly positive and the law of attraction and shifting that for people um and you just like you said leading by example if you're just going overkill abundance you're going to attract great people that want to join your bandwagon and they're like oh I like Catherine's Kool-Aid she's drinking I want some of that so <laughs> <laughs> we also make sure we do fun things with midwives together um and even other people in the community together because if we only gather to do peer review and talk about our struggles that's not fun yeah. Um, so as I said, I like to kayak. Sometimes I'll bring as many midwives as I can and we just go float on the Laguna. Um, and the silliness of being in the water in a group of yeah. women where it, um, it brings more richness to the conversation beyond taking out a chart and reading about that case. Right. We've had a few like thinking outside the box, like what could a birth center be? What could a community center be? And we were joking about like, I love my hot tub at home. I love this sanctuary. How do we make the community center have a hot tub? Like we're just brainstorming. Like <laughs> we can have a spa room that's for the clients, but then on Friday nights, the wives get to choose to join it together. Like these are the things that solve problems. Like how, what do you love on your own that, you know, it's not pressured. You don't have to make a big headache. And so we're like, these are the things thinking outside the box, how to create win-wins, how to like, we're even talking with our birth centers. We're opening, getting family-friendly dorms for the students, plus a daycare on site. That's part of the staff benefits, part of, because that you, would you be see, amazing. Yeah. So like how, like 
our emphasis for our, our birth centers is community centers. Like these are bringing the glue back. And so I'm very passionate. Um, Hillary Slinger talks often about what you're discussing as well. She's a CNM CPM from Arizona about this new, let's unify midwives to back to our roots, the community health. Like she's trying to get a lot of legislature so we can unify programs of like, we are nurses. We're not extenders of physicians. We are the expert in community-based support and how do we do that shift and so trying to get well the birth center is part of the community center but the midwife running it mm -hmm. is the glue and nutrition health finances fun time like how can we go back to the what midwives used to be so it'll be fun to see what the right. new age birth centers community okay. centers that midwives are running are going to look like well it's, it's just such an opportunity right mm -hmm. as pregnancy is it's an opportunity for people to change their entire life and they're kind of mm -hmm. willing to do it so making a bigger opportunity um, mm -hmm. and to build on that. I love that concept. Perfect. Well, Catherine, I always end with um, just asking for your words of wisdom. Like if there's anything, um, whether they're new, experienced midwives listening to this, what would be something you want them to take home from your experience or your what really impacted you, someone else has said? Um, you know, we, I guess uh, the five I have these five principles I live by um, and what, four of them are from the book, a book. And the fifth one is from a six year old, but um, be impeccable with your word. Uh, don't take things personally. Don't make assumptions. Always do your best. And this one's from the six year old. Have fun every day. And I had that on my wall. I had it in my office, but it's just that place of really do your work to know where you are in your experience, in the equation. Um, and if I go through those concepts every day and I look at it, it really helps me figure out situations yeah. um, and show up with integrity. Oh my so, gosh. and as I said, I have to have it written down, um, but, um, and none of them are my concepts but, yeah. it helps but gentle reminders of like okay I'm always going to show up my best I'm not going to assume like I think having that reinforcing subconscious because our, our human nature is the opposite of that instinctually we're like judge because it's fight or flight we have to make a decision we have mm -hmm. like the ego in us is like I know what's best I'm going to tell you that so we're going against our human nature every single day but um you've right. definitely been doing uh so yeah I'm going to have to make the same thing put up on my vision board those five principles they're amazing so thank you thank you Perfect. So Catherine, how can they get a hold of you if they have questions, they want to get some feedback from you um, of how to support their local communities? Indeed. Uh, SonomaCountyMidwives.com is my website and you can find us there. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah. Well, you enjoy California weather. I'm in Michigan and it's fall. I keep joking that I want the best of both worlds. It's a beautiful fall, like lots of colors, but when you're like 40 degrees and you're but used to- You know what's coming too. It's going to get I, I, I'm not. I'm going to be a snowbird through and through. I know that my husband loves the winter and I was like, well, I'm not going to see you much in the summer and or winter unless you want to come visit me somewhere warm. But yeah, it's funny. Like I'm like, I'm so I'm, I'm blessed that we have so many choices of weather around here, but I always get jealous of the ladies in the desert and in the, um, the California with, <laughs> when it comes winter time so we'll have to make oh, an excuse so for a spoiled. retreat year away in january february indeed. we can all come to <laughs> indeed we have beautiful things here <laughs> perfect well thank you so much Catherine. i, I really appreciate it i so enjoyed here. this yeah you're amazing i think we need more of these stories out there i think too many people i started it in covid three four years ago because the intention okay. was these basic relationships of like, I loved listening to the journey to midwifery podcast, but it was only getting one angle. It was getting their story versus where you are now and where are you going? And I think we just need more of that positive. Re There's always challenges out there, but everything's figure outable. It, sometimes it's just finding a different resource, finding a different angle. Like sometimes we feel cornered because there is a few more options. You just can't see them yet. So I think like you said, that's what gets me through each day. I know there are options. I've figured them out yet and also this is made for humans and I'm a human so 
I'll figure it out. Love it. It's um, a great <laughs> attitude. So, I mean, a lot of people close do off opportunities purely because they say, I can't do it that way. That's not possible. And your own glass ceiling effect, like makes it so it's not possible. This opportunity can hit you in the face, but your subconscious put blinders onto it already. Um, so yeah, having that approach of everything's figure outable there. We, when we opened our birth center, they laughed at me, but I've got such cheesy, positive affirmations all through the center. Like, because the whole point is you need gentle kindness you around you all the time like oh shit this is a okay Leslie just shoved this in my face that everything's figure outable I am my worst enemy blah 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 but that's the important but you like, need the visual input you do yeah. I um I live in a tiny house on wheels that I built myself and the entire time people are like well you can't do that because you don't know how to build houses like I don't but I own tools and no one can stop me <laughs> So, I can learn. I don't know yet. I yet is learn. that most powerful word. Yeah, they talk in psychology, yes. the power of using the word yet. I don't know yet. I, I, I haven't done that yet. yet, but it, it gets your mind and my, in a different thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my lovely son is like, mom, you can learn everything on YouTube. And he's right. So yeah. <laughs> yep, we have the knowledge at our fingertips. What our forefathers could have done if they would have had the internet at their fingertips. And that's what <laughs> is interesting to me of like, People always say, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I'm like, I, like people ask questions. I was like, well, I don't know, but I can figure it out in 30 seconds. Google it and know the right words. Like I, will... I said, it's pretty rare to not find some of these answers we need or in I other industries. Because sometimes if you get too specific, yes. like how do I solve this problem in midwifery? I've had fun with chat GTP just to see what the World Wide Web says. Like I'll just put in a question. Oh, I feel man. like it's almost an aura. I'm like, okay, so how would I solve world, world hunger? And then you'd listen to what chat GTP says or how would would you That's change a maternity health care system like just like what is the world wide web pull and then you just copy those things into our angles so i have so much fun just it's like cool. brainstorming with a buddha that's virtual like that's the way i feel that's like virtual. yeah a virtual buddha our, uh, our, um, our our bigger vision here is we're working um in terms of why can't we start on a community level to provide home birth covered by our medical insurance um, like everyone's like, it's, you know, you have to start the whole country. I'm like, but why can't we start in our community? Like our community started on Santa Rosa, this um, in response team. So if there's a mental health crisis that doesn't involve weapons or a drug situation, you can call in response and it's an ambulance with a um, paramedic, a MFT and an advocate for um, homelessness and drug dependency. So they can come and take care of that person on the street, keep them out of jail, keep them from being 5150. And I'm like, okay, so we made that happen in our community. We can do small things in terms of getting more people access to home births. Yeah, so it, we're could working with a, our yeah local it could be a community. foundation, it could be a supplemental insurance. Like people think, well, it has to be fighting to get Medicaid to change their policies. And, and it's like you said, thinking outside the box, like you just need revenue yeah. coming in to support the home birth. Why does it have to, if we don't want to fight the fight of the federal state um, insurance policies, maybe there's a co community philanthropist that love your idea and concept, and they're going to create a home birth for all foundation. And then that's what pays for it. And you we could have be... the local doctors on board, like, what do we need to do to make this happen? So, I mean, and that mm -hmm. bigger picture, right? That's right. going to take a long time, but still. Building the relationships. The yeah. yeah, perfect. Well, yeah. I am excited. I wish we had more midwives awesome. out there in the world like you, Catherine. This would be a dangerous Thank place you. to live in if you and I were had more of us out there. <laughs> so. Good thing there's some distance. Thank you for yeah. uh, a really lovely afternoon. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll talk to you soon, Catherine. Okay. Bye. Mm -hmm.